Greetings again today on this beautiful Easter Sunday morning. We welcome you here in the Northside Baptist Church. We appreciate your presence. We appreciate our visitors. May the good Lord bless you for coming this way. We thank God for this beautiful day and what it stands for. You that's listening out in the radio listening audience most certainly appreciate you tuning in the Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church here in Athens, Georgia. Now this is Preacher Edward speaking. And if you'll get on that phone and call a friend and have them to tune in and get this hour coming up, I feel we can be an inspiration to them. So you do be doing them a favor and us as well. I trust you do so. And I want you to take your Bible and turn to the book of Luke chapter 24, will you please? I'm going to speak on the subject, Gone. Now, Tony said that was one of my favorite songs, which he is, and I'm using that for my subject today, Gone. And you turn to Luke chapter 24 for the reading of God's Word. Now, Brother Gibson mentioned his son, Robert, who went on to be with the Lord from Vietnam. And he mentioned the date. It never registered with me. But on that date, March the 16th in World War II, I came the closest to being killed in combat of my entire service for our country. Pinned down between a river and Apache woods with about five machine guns turned on us and the bullets knocking mud in our faces as we were pinned down to the ground. But God saw fit to see me through. My good friend James Ginn sitting back there, he we took our training together in Camp Blandon, Florida. They sent him to the 26th Division, me to the 36th, and uh, sent me to Italy, and then across into France and Germany, sent him to France, and he was wounded over there in the war. So I came out without a scratch. He came out wounded and still limps because of it. And, and then uh, Robert, God took him on home. Now we can't understand these things, but God knows what he's doing. And this is God's business, and probably Robert will do more in his short life and the sacrifice he made for his country for God than he would have if he'd lived to be 75, 80 years old. God knows and understands these things. Robert was a fine Christian young man, yeah. saved under my ministry in Vietnam, I mean, uh, in uh, Union Point, and I baptized him. And he loved the Lord. Now, I'm going to say this Lyndon Bain Johnson. The Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, all the warlords and leaders that's responsible for that Vietnam mess over there is going to answer to God for it. They're going to have the blood of over 50,000 fine young Americans on their hands, plus the Vietnamese that were killed over there in South Vietnam and other anti-communist people. Those leaders are not going to get by. Now, they may get by without a trial and without be a, a hanging here in America, but they're going to face God in the judgment. Amen. And every leader that's responsible for that Vietnam mess is going to give an account to God Almighty for the blood that was shed and our boys has been killed. I appreciate our young men that's willing to go and do their duty. And they were doing their duty. And doing what the government said do, but the leaders are the ones going to answer to God for it. It's certain, as I'm talking to you today, they're not going to get by. They're going to give an account unto God for that terrible mess in Vietnam that this country is still suffering from and those nations over there are still suffering. Don't get by with things like that. That's not my message, but I just want to tell you that. Now the tape today will be tape number 364. Tape number 364 entitled Gone. If you'd like to have this tape of this message and music today, singing, then you write in and close a gift of $3 or more, request it, we get it in the mail to you. If you'd like to have a list of our tape, we have about 365 listed, or 355 rather listed, and we send you a list and choose the tape that you prefer. Many of them on prophecy and various other subjects you're interested in. Just request it by number or by title and say, Preacher, send me this tape. Now I have here in my hand book number four of my books on Bible questions and answers everyone should know. We have five of these books. On page five, you'll find the answer to these questions. 
Where is the name of the state capital that contains the music city USA in the Bible? To what great prophet did the Lord show a basket of summer fruit? Where does the Bible say God weighed mountains in scales? Where did God say you could not even trust a friend? Where in the Bible is Palestine called the Holy Land? Where is the first mention of the first Baptist in the Bible? How many times is the name Baptist mentioned in the Bible? What chapter in the Bible do we find where God changed the name of Abram and Sarah to Abraham and Sarah? Or Sarah, or Abram and Sarah to Abraham and Sarah. Who was the first Baptist put to death because of his conviction? Where do we find the first record in the Bible of an angel visiting the earth? Who named Ishmael in the Bible? What woman in the Bible had a quarrel with a Baptist preacher and wanted to kill him? What did God tell Abraham and Sarah that made them both laugh? When did God say it was time for a woman to fix her fingernails? When did God say for a woman to spit in a man's face? You find these answers in book number four. If you write in and close a gift of $2 or more and request the book, I'll send it to you. If you'd like to have all five of the books, send a gift of $10. We'll send them to you. You can learn a lot of things from these Bible questions. I've been on the air more than 40 years daily, daily up until maybe a few months ago, but I've been on more than 40 years. And many of these have been asked me since I've been in the ministry. I compile them and put them in the book form. And you write in and get these books. It'll be a blessing to you. My mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia, 30603, is the zip code number. Now you pray for me and write to me next week. It'll mean a lot to me because we're working together and getting out the gospel. This is the faith ministry. And I depend upon those that love God to work with me and helping me get the gospel out in the closing days of this grace age. Luke chapter 24, verse 1. Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulcher, bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. They found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher, and they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. And it came to pass, as they were much perplexed thereabout, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. In other words, he's gone. He is not here. But he is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was with you in Galilee, saying the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. They remembered his words. And he returned from the sepulchre and told all these things unto the eleven and to all the rest. And it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and other women that were with them which told these things unto the apostles. And their words seemed to them as idle tales, and they believed them not. Then arose Peter and ran unto the sepulchre and stooping down. He beheld the linen clothes laid by themselves and departed, wondering in himself at that which was come to pass. That's reading from Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 12. May God add his richest blessings in reading his word. Yes, when they came to the tomb, they found he was gone. I want to talk about that and talk about some witnesses that also said he was gone. They could not find his body. About two weeks ago, I walked into that tomb, and once again, I saw it was empty. Tony had a group on the inside of the tomb, and they sang the song pertaining to the resurrection. Tears streamed down the face of the people, but we were all glad because he was gone. We did not find our Savior in the tomb. He came out. After 72 hours, he came out. Jesus was crucified on Wednesday afternoon, laid in the grave at 6 o'clock on Wednesday evening, stayed in the grave Wednesday night, Thursday, Thursday night, Friday, Friday night, and Saturday, exactly three days and three nights, and he came out of the grave at 6 o'clock on Saturday at the end of the Sabbath. You may say, Preach Edward, didn't the Bible say after he was crucified the next day was a Sabbath? Yes. But there were three Sabbaths that fell in order that year. They have an annual Sabbath, which was a high day, and another on Friday, and another on Saturday. 
It was on Thursday, the high day, they was talking about the day before the Sabbath, not the weekly Sabbath. And so he was crucified, stayed in the grave 72 hours. The theory today of Good Friday and Jesus being crucified on Friday is not biblical. That came out of the filthy rags of Rome. That's not biblical at all. That's contrary to the teaching of God's word. Jesus plainly said, as Jonah was in the belly of the whale three days and three nights, so must the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. You can't get three days and three nights out of that and crucify Jesus on Friday. You just can't do it. You couldn't get over two nights at the most and maybe a day or a day and a half. You just can't do that. Now, that's not according to the scripture. They failed to study the word of God. They failed to understand the scriptures. They went by tradition and listened to tradition and the red tradition and not the word of God. Jesus Christ came out of the grave at 6 o'clock on Saturday evening at the end of the weekly Sabbath after spending 72 days in the grave. Now there's witnesses that saw him. First of all, you want to place a witness in the stand by the name of Mary Magdalene. Let's ask Mary Magdalene about Jesus. She was saved, a demon, several devils cast out of her, seven devils. And she was saved a terrible life of sin and she loved the Lord Jesus with all of her heart. She was the last to leave the cross when they crucified him. She was the first to go back to his grave and saw it empty. In Matthew chapter 20 and verse 1, In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. So she was the first to come back to check on her Lord. And she saw him not. It broke her heart. She loved the Lord Jesus because he loved her and forgave her of her sins and pardoned her from all of her iniquity and made a saint of God out of her. She had a great testimony. She was converted. She was brought to Christ. And then later she met him in the garden and he called her by name. And then ever when, when she was in the garden grieving, she said, they've taken my Lord away. I know not where they've laid him. And all of a sudden, someone said, Mary. She said, Abonii. Master, She recognized that voice. Jesus had the same voice sound after his resurrection in his glorified body that he had before he was crucified, buried, and rose again. Because she recognized that voice. He didn't say, I am Jesus. The very moment he spoke, she recognized his voice. She loved the Lord. She wanted to touch him. He said, don't touch me. I got to yet go to my father. And he would not let her touch him at that particular time. But we have this great witness. Witness the fact that he's gone. He wasn't there. He left the tomb. Out he went. And he went back to be with the Father in heaven later. He descended out of that grave down in the heart of the earth. He carried with him the thief on the cross that died knowing Jesus. And down into Abraham's bosom they went. And then later Jesus came out of the heart of the earth and went back to heaven after being seen on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. Mary Magdalene, one of the greatest witnesses you find in the word of God. Very devoted to Jesus. Loved him with all of her heart. Secondly, there was another witness by the name of Simon Peter. Simon Peter was a great war horse of God. Great man of God. A mighty preacher. And he had something to say about it too. In Luke chapter 24 and verse 12, Then arose Peter... And ran unto the supper, and stooping down, he beheld the linen clothes laid by themselves, and departed, warning in himself at that which was come to pass. When Simon Peter went into that tomb, there he saw the linen clothes as they were when they were around the body of Jesus. Jesus didn't tangle the clothes up and unwrap himself like they did in those days. He just left them. And they found them wrapped just like they were around the body of Jesus when they buried him. They used to wrap him in those days from head to foot, put a napkin over their face, uh, wrap their uh, napkin over their head under their chin. And it was right there just like Jesus left it when he came out of it. And that was a clothes. And that puzzled Simon Peter. How could he gotten out of those clothes and without untangling them or unwrapping himself? But he did. He was God. And Simon Peter told the story over and over again about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There was a time when he walked afar off. 
There may be a time when we walk afar off, but there ought to always be a time when we come back closer to God. And then Jesus, knowing Simon Peter had a broken heart because he had denied the Lord three times, and Jesus goes and pays him a special and personal visit after his resurrection. Jesus knew his preacher. He knew one of his apostles had a broken and bleeding heart. And Jesus appeared to him alone and there talked with Simon Peter. I believe he encouraged him. I believe he said, Simon, I understand. You were bragging about you wouldn't leave me. You'd not deny me. You'd go to jail, even death. And Simon, I had to get those curses out of you. Simon, I had to let you know that you must depend upon me by strength to live for me. You can't do it within yourself, Simon. And I had to let the devil shake those curses out of you to straighten you out. Now, after that occasion, Simon Peter walked with God, and he was a giant for God. There may be times, are you listening to me? There may be times when God will allow the devil to shake some curses out of you. There may be a time when God will allow the devil to let something happen to you, to throw you on your face before him. There may be a time when God will let the devil really trick you in order to straighten you out. Sometimes people are so pharisaical, so goody-goody, have all the answers and nothing can uh, deter them from serving God and they begin to brag on themselves and Jesus sometimes just let them fall flat on their face and when they get up, they're willing to serve God. That was a case of Simon Peter. When he got up, he was willing to serve the Lord. Great witness for God. On the day of Pentecost, he stood there and preached that great and powerful sermon and 3,000 people come to know God. What a witness. Of course, he went fishing after he backslid on God. He went fishing, but caught nothing, and Jesus taught him a lesson about that as well. And in number three, the next witness is John the Beloved, the younger of the apostles, very close to the heart of Jesus. He was the baby apostle, as it were, the younger of the group, leaned upon the chest of Jesus there in the upper room. Very dear. The Bible refers to him as the apostle that Jesus loved. You know, sometimes that's even natural today for parents to even show a little partiality toward the baby and the family. And maybe not that they really love them more, but they just lean in that direction and show a little partiality more than the others that's come along earlier. That happens many times. And that's what happened here among the apostles. John was the beloved apostle, the younger of the group, and Jesus loved him. The Bible said that the apostle that Jesus loved referred to him. In John chapter 20, verses 2 through 4, Then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other apostle. And uh, the Bible tells us here then in, in verses, uh, John 20, verses 2 through 4, when Jesus, the apostle whom Jesus loved, referring to John, and saith unto them, they have taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre, and we know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth, and the other disciple, and came to the sepulchre. So they ran both of them together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter, and came first to the sepulchre. Now when they heard, when Mary told them that Jesus was not in the tomb, that he was gone, then Simon Peter and the apostle John took off as fast as they could run, to get to that tomb. They wanted to see for themselves. Simon Peter wanted to see with his own eyes. John wanted to see. And John outran Simon Peter. He was younger. I don't know, I just surmised Simon Peter was a big old stalwart, strong man. And John maybe just an average sized man. And John outran Simon and got the tomb first and ran in the tomb. And lo and behold, he was not there. He was gone. And then we find that Simon Peter followed him in, took a good look at the linen clothes. Jesus was not there. He was gone. Jesus was gone. They saw him. And later on, we find that John, the beloved, out on the Isle of Patmos, Jesus again appeared to him and revealed to him the book of Revelation. John was beloved apostle very close, very close to the heart of our dear Savior. Then we move on to another witness by the name of Cleophas. 
The Bible tells us in Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 18, after Jesus had been gone out of the tomb, something happened. The Bible said, and behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was in Jerusalem about three, four, three score furlong. And they talked together of all the things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were holding. They did not know him. And he said unto them, What manner of communication are these that you have one to another as you walk and are sad? Now they were sad, the Bible said. And the one of them said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem? Hast thou not known the things which have come to pass there in these days? These two men talked about Jesus and what he did, about his miracles, about his crucifixion. And then they heard that he had risen again from the dead. They couldn't understand it. And they were very sad. All of a sudden, Jesus appears on the scene and began to talk with them. And he said, oh, you're slow of heart to believe you believe not the, the uh, prophets, the, the Psalms and the prophets and what the Bible has to say about this man, Jesus. If you'd have believed what the Old Testament said about Jesus, you'd understand this. And the Bible said their hearts began to burn within them as Jesus talked with them by the way. Have you ever begun to read your Bible and God bless you so until you can hardly behave yourself and your heart began to burn within you? And you rejoice because you have spiritual heartburns. The word of God begins to saturate your soul and stir you and warm you up. And there you begin to praise God. Have you ever done that? Oh, you say, preacher, haven't you? ought to stay in the word long enough and let God speak to your heart and find that you'll have spiritual heartburns. And so we find that Jesus, uh, they turned into a certain place and uh, he turned in with them. And after he found out who Jesus was, then they said, did not our heart burn within us as he taught with us, by the way? A couple of years ago, I traveled this road from Jerusalem down to Emmaus. And as I traveled along, I thought about these two men as they walked along and Jesus came to the rescue. We come to another witness and the other witness is a Roman centurion. The other witness is a great uh, a general, a great soldier. And he was the man that gave the orders for the soldiers to put Jesus to death. In Matthew chapter 27, verse 54, and when the centurion, now a centurion is a man that had in charge of a hundred troops. Now when the centurion, they that were with him watching Jesus saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly saying, truly, this was the son of God. This old army leader, general, captain, probably a captain, watched them as they crucified Jesus. He watched them as they nailed the nails in his hands and in his feet. He watched them as they penetrated his side with a sword and the earth quake and uh, the darkness came over the earth. And the old centurion said, surely, surely this must be the son of God. This is the son of God without a doubt. And he testified that a fact that he was a, a great witness of Jesus Christ being the son of God. Then we come to the next one who is Thomas. And Thomas here is also a great witness to the resurrection of our Lord. The centurion only gave witness to the crucifixion, being sure that he was dead. And uh, the solemn fact that he died, he didn't just swoon away or half dead or be revived later. No, sir. The centurion witnessed the fact that man is dead and he must be the son of God. And he was. We find Thomas, one of the 12, in John chapter 20, verses 24 through 28. But Thomas, one of the 12, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciple therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto him, Except I shall see in his hands the prints of the nails, thrust my hand into his side, I'll not believe it. And after eight days again, his disciples were with them and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the door being shut and stood in the midst, and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he, 
to Thomas, reach hither thy hand, and behold my hands. Reach hither thy hand, and thrust into my side, and be not faithless, but believe. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Now Thomas here is the one to call the doubter. Now he missed church one Sunday, and he missed a lot. At the resurrection of Jesus Christ, they met on that Lord's day and talking about it. And Jesus came on the scene, met with him. Thomas wasn't there. He, 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 he missed a lot. They told him about Jesus had risen from the dead. He said, I, I just don't believe it. Now, if he had been at church on that Sunday, he'd have known better. My, how many church members have the name on the church roll and some even saved. They lay out of church on Sunday when they ought to be in God's house. My, what they miss. What you miss in God's house on Sunday, you can't make it up the next Sunday. It's gone forever. And you're the loser. You ought to find your place in the house of God every Lord's day. There's never been a time whenever you need to be faithful in serving God as in this hour. Thomas was a doubter. You know, when they came and told him that Lazarus had died, told Jesus. And Jesus said, well, I'll, I'll go over there and check on him. Uh, what did Thomas say? Thomas said, I said, well, we might as well go ahead and die with him. They'll kill him and they'll kill us. We might as well go and die too. Now that is the attitude he had. That was Thomas for you. And later on, we find in John chapter 14, uh, Jesus said, uh, I am the way, the truth. And like Thomas, that's it, Thomas. He said, well, how can we know the way? We well, don't know the way. How can we know? That's Thomas saying that. Jesus said, Thomas, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Then on another occasion, whenever they told Thomas he's risen from the dead, he's gone. Ah, uh, he said, I, I, I won't believe that unless I can uh, see the scars in his hands and see the scars in his feet. And then uh, on his side, I, I, I might believe that. That's Thomas. And Jesus knew Thomas said that. And the next Sunday, Jesus said, Thomas, put your hands in these scars, son. Put your hand in the scar on my side, son. And Thomas did that and said, my Lord and my God. Now, many times we criticize Thomas. We call him, call him Doubting Thomas. And I guess rightly so. But there's another fact we need to look at here. That's your mind, a man. That is, Thomas wanted to be sure about all these things. He didn't want anybody to shoot a curb to him. He wanted to be sure about these things. And that's why he asked the question. That's why he was pessimistic. That's why that they had to show him before he believed. Thomas was that kind of a fellow, but he gave a great testimony to the resurrection of Jesus Christ our Lord. And then the final witness I want to bring out today, which is an amazing man, and this one is none other than Saul of Tarsus. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 8, and last of all he was seen also of me as one born out of due season. O Saul was a troublemaker, a Christian arrester, one that gave consent to putting Stephen to death, a murderer, if you please, a man that hated Jesus Christ, a man that hated uh, Christians and wanted to see them warped away from the face of the earth, despised them. One day on the road to Damascus, and it's my privilege many years ago to travel down that road in Damascus, and there God dethroned Paul. God unsaddled him. God brought him down on Damascus Turnpike. He hit the ground. God struck him down. And when Paul hit the ground, he said, uh, Lord, what would thou have me to do? Jesus said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? He persecuted God's people. And persecuting God's people, he was guilty of persecuting Jesus. At any time you persecute God's people, you're guilty of persecuting the Lord. Any time you mistreat or do wrong toward one of God's little ones, you're doing it against Jesus. You don't get by with it. You do it against Jesus, as the Bible tells us. Brother Lawrence, I heard him teaching his class this morning, brought that out about uh, 
uh, criticizing a man of God or God's uh, people, which is wrong, because you do it whenever you preach and teach again to do things against the man of God or God's people. You're doing it against the Lord. And here we find the next witness, Saul of Tarsus, one of the great witnesses of the resurrection of Jesus Christ that ever lived. He preached that theme over and over and over again. He always liked to preach on the resurrection. During World War II, when the Turks controlled Jerusalem, General Allaby, a British general, came in and conquered Jerusalem. That's during the First World War. Took it away from the Turks. And when he was coming in, these Turks went to the, then they thought was the tomb of Jesus, had many, many, many precious items in there, gold, silver, and whatnot. And they raided that tomb and carried all of that stuff out and carried it back to Turkey and left that tomb empty. Left it empty. When General Adelby came in, there was nothing in that tomb. All the wealth had been taken out. That was uh, uh, the tomb, not the garden tomb. One day thought where Jesus was buried. We saw that also. We see it on our tour to the Holy Land. But anyway, that tomb was empty when General Adelby came in. Beloved, I went into a tomb not two weeks, about two weeks ago. It wasn't that one, but it was the real tomb down in at the Gordon's uh, Garden. And there I went into the tomb where they buried our Lord, and it was empty. And I'm glad because the tomb was empty one day when they place you in the grave, your grave's going to be empty. That grave can't hold you very long. That body's got to come out. Brother Gibson, one of these days, Robert's coming out of that grave at Evergreen. He's coming out of there. He's not going to be there forever. He's coming out. And you'll be able to meet him in there. And all of our loved ones gone on to be with the Lord. They're coming out. I want to give this illustration as I bring my message toward a close. I give it, I think, about every Easter, but it's so fitting. I think that maybe someone haven't heard it and uh, you would like to use to hear the illustration. There's a man one time traveling in a country looking for some fellow that lived in a beautiful white mansion. And he couldn't locate. He's way out in the country. And he's traveling over a very rough road. And many times would slide into the ditch and bump along and trying to get to this mansion. He met a person coming down that very rough road. And he said, sir, could you tell me where Mr. So-and-so dwells? He said, yes, sir, I can. He said, you go on down this road, it's very rough. And said, you come to a cemetery. He said, now when you come to the cemetery, the cemetery, the road leads right through that cemetery. But said, when you get beyond that cemetery, there's a beautiful white mansion. And that's where he dwells. That's his home. Praise God. You're traveling a rough road right now. A rough road. And you're headed toward that cemetery if Jesus tears his coming. But beyond that cemetery, there's a mansion on the other side. Aren't you glad about that? I am. Thank God. They say he's gone. They went in the grave, but they said he's gone. And they told the truth. He was gone. And when they put you in the grave one day, when the resurrection takes place, You'll be gone too. But you may be alive and go at the rapture. Who knows? I trust you will. Let's stand to our feet. Father in heaven, I pray that you'll take the message and use it. We know that Jesus was gone when they went in that tomb. He wasn't there. He's now at thy right hand, Father. And he's looking upon this scene today. Now I'm glad our loved ones must come out of the grave. They can't stay there. And I'm glad for the rapture. Some will never see the graveyard. But go by the way of the rapture. Lord, there may be somebody here that's not saved today. Maybe somebody here backslidden. There may be some precious people here. They like Northside and looking for a church home and believe what we believe and might want to join this church. God, if that's the case, let them come forward that we might present them to the church to become members. Had we in this invitation... I pray in Christ's name, amen. Debbie's going to play for us. Are you listening? 
If you're here today and you're not saved, you ought to come down here and get right with God. You ought to do it. If you're backslidden, you ought to come back to God. If you want to join this church and you want a good fundamental Bible.